I'm Gene O'Hara, the director of the Montgomery Executive Professor Program here for the College of Business. On behalf of our faculty and administration and staff of Montgomery College of Business, I want to express how pleased we are that we're all getting tonight. And, and we have the opportunity to share these outstanding speakers and thinkers and major global business uh, influencers that come to our, our campus under the uh, Montford Executive Professor Program uh, sponsorship. I think this is exactly what Kitty and Myra uh, Montford had in mind when they agreed to fund the Executive Professor Program uh, with the mission of trying to integrate uh, the professional experience uh, from the business world with the theoretical base of business education. Because of their generosity, we're able to do this and not have to charge a fee uh, for you. So uh, we're, we're just very pleased to do that tonight. Let me stop and ask a question here. How many of you are aware that yesterday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, hit an all-time so I see quite a few hands up there, and uh, from, from those of you in the business world, uh, I would bet you know, there are people my age who uh, probably paid pretty close attention to what's happening with our U.S. stock market because we had the experience a number of times. Once, but uh, I'll, I'll just reference uh, as the bull market was growing in 2005, 6, 7, they hit an all time peak in October 2007. We rolled that market up, and then 2009, many of us rolled the market back down. And when that was happening, our speaker tonight was warning investors. That all-time high in October of 2007 was based on a bubble economy. And in fact, uh, Robert Whitmer published his, uh, his book, The American Bubble Economy in 2006, explaining why the bubble economy was, uh, was in place in driving the market. He, he went on to publish Two other uh, New York Times bestsellers, Aftershock and Aftershock for the Investor. We've got another book that you can pick up uh, outside the door here. Uh, he's well published with his theories on uh, the bubble economy that we're going through in this country. So it's very timely that uh, yesterday the stock market went up to a higher mark today. But it, it's very timely that Robert Whitmer is here uh, with us tonight to talk about uh, his projections for our U.S. economy in 2013. So uh, you, some of you may already know Robert Whitmer because he has been on, in recent months, I, I know I've uh, seen Robert several times on our television news uh, stations talking about uh, his analysis of not only the U.S. economy, but the world of economy. So it, it's with great pleasure that uh, I have the opportunity to introduce to you Mr. Robert Whitmer uh, to talk to you about the aftershock perspective of our economy in 2013. Robert, please come to the stage. Okay. I usually don't have 
special audio recording. I just have to be a little bit careful about this. So uh, with that, it's fantastic being in uh, Denver, or Denver area, excuse me. Uh, and uh, I love being in Colorado. In general, I actually was born in Albuquerque. So uh, I lived a good part of my life here. I used to vacation a lot in Arizona. And I really enjoy it. And thanks so much for bringing the blue skies, because every now and then it snows here. Um, and it was beautiful. In fact, I guess it was just last week we were saying that Denver was all shut in and so forth. And then you know, yesterday when I woke up, it was absolutely beautiful. Nice, nice weather. So good to be up here and uh, good to be speaking. Uh, we're going to talk about the aftershock uh, and kind of what it means for the economy and what was sort of the theories of what we were talking about earlier. And let's see, I'm going to try one slide here. This is just a video. This will go over kind of some of the issues I'm going to talk about tonight. Let's hope it works. If it doesn't, it's going to say fix. Okay, that did work. One small problem is because of the fonts sometimes picked up, there's a little bit of overlap. It shouldn't happen too often, but um, as Gene said, uh, the first book was America's Bubble Economy. Um, did fairly well. Uh, actually, we got a number of people, Dow Jones, who felt uh, you know, it was you know, a good book, and um, America's Bubble Economy's prediction was you know, accurate, uh, which I think was quite true. Um, talk more about that. If Aftershock came out in 2009, um, also, it was pretty well regarded. We actually got as high as number two on the New York Times bestseller list, and that was for the second edition. I always say, you know, the second time you write something, it always comes out better, and this kind of case it did. Uh, I also like to start out any um, program or any discussion of the economy or, or investments, uh, a little bit of humor. Uh, hopefully this reads kind of okay, that's fine. Uh, you know, how do you know if you have a problem with your financial system? Because when the bank returns your check for insufficient funds, they have to ask whether they meant you or them. And that's right. It's been a little bit tricky for banks, um, for others. Um, it's been tough. And, you know, I, I put a lot of cartoons in my book. Again, because anything about economics tends to be a little bit dull, right? So, so uh, a few um, cartoons. This one kind of says it all. You know, I mean, we're homeless. And it has been a very difficult time. We're, coming out of a lot of it now, but it's still tough. It's still very tough for a lot of people. Unemployment's high. We still have a lot of issues in the real estate market, the economy, and the world economy. Uh, and so because of that, what people want to hear is, no, well, another cartoon. Tell me the fairy tale about the economy. That's what dad's going to tell his daughter. Uh, and that's also what people like to see in economists. Um, they really want to see, uh, you know, tell me when this whole thing's going to turn around. They want, they want, they want the good news. As I was told many times, talk about all the good news. And there is good news, but uh, what we think is the best to do is to be the good doctor. Uh, what do I mean by that? That means that if you were coming to the doctor and let's say you had pneumonia, and you came in and the doctor looked at you and he says, you're fine, take two aspirin, go home and rest, slap it in the back, and in a week you'll be in great shape. And in a week, you're dead. Okay, it made you feel better at first, right? I thought I had a big problem, and, and you know, the doctor said I did, and everything was great. And so everything was fine, but that really wasn't advice you needed, was it? You really needed that honest, you know, forthright advice as to what's going on. And that's really what we try to be here. We try to be the good doctor. It might not always be the most comfortable thing to hear. It might not be the quote, not always the good news, so there's definitely good news in it. Um, but it's, I think it's very important to be very straightforward on what's going on. Um, so the two books, each about 250 pages, I'll try to summarize in basically just a, a few sentences here. What we're trying to say in America's bubble economy, this is again, came out in 2006, is that America's economy had been boosted uh, by four bubbles. There's stock market, housing, private uh, debt, and consumer spending. And they work together on an interactive basis to boost the economy. A very obvious example would be um, home equity loans. So let's say you, you know, your house price went up in value. Uh, you could get a home equity loan from a private credit person, a bank who's dying to lend to you, and they really were back then. Uh, and you go out and you take that money and you spend it. And that kind of boosts consumer spending, boosts the economy. And you can see it all works together. Boosts the stock market. Everything's working together to interactively boost the economy. What we said is that at some point, 
One of those bubbles are going to burst, and that's going to be housing, and it's going to be the rest of them down. So once housing bursts, it's going to push the stock market, consumer spending, um, and private debt, or private credit all down. And that is it. Uh, stock market came down. Uh, consumer spending dropped. With the consumer supposedly you know, never quit spending. It did. It stopped a lot. And of course, the banking system, well, we all know what happened to that. Um, much of it basically went under. Uh, from the biggest banks to the biggest investment banks, all in huge trouble. So that's exactly what happened. But what we said is what's going to happen in response is they're going to build two new bubbles. We're going to pump them up, and those can act like airbags that will support those four bubbles and actually maybe even you know, push them back up a bit. And those two bubbles are the government debt bubble and the dollar bubble. And that's exactly what happened. We increased our government debt from 170 billion in 2007 to a peak over 1.3 trillion, still about 1 trillion. Massive increase, 500% increase in the amount of borrowing. We also increased our, the dollar bubble is really money printing. We increased our money supply from about 800 billion to 3 trillion. You know, 200% increase, 300% increase. So you can see we, that's exactly what we did. We, we, what we predicted is we pump up these bubbles and, um, and it worked. And as, as Gene was saying, you know, our market's back to where it was in 2007. So you know, we pumped up a lot, housing's turning around. Um, but the problem is they are bubbles. And ultimately they're gonna pop. That is because there's nothing, there's no sustainable economic reason for them. You're just pumping them up to try to keep everything else from going down. So let's talk about when they might pop. It was what, what's going on here? I mean, maybe we've got two new bubbles, but you know, who cares, right? As long as we keep doing this stuff, keep borrowing and printing, everything's going to be fine. And we'll keep things up and maybe we'll be able to get out of it. Well, here's what we said with kind of using the same logic we'll use on the government debt dollar bubble. Uh, that we used in the housing bubble, you know, because clearly we had kind of the same thing. House prices were going way up, you know, 80% more in some places, but overall about that. Whereas income was only going about 2%. The logic here is that fundamentally this is unsustainable. You cannot have home prices going up that fast with income not going up. Well, people say everyone wants to live in San Francisco or New York, they want to live in New urban areas or wherever, and so we need all this housing. But sure, people may want to, but if they don't have the money to pay for it, it ain't going to work. And we said at some point that would pop. That was the basic logic behind what we're saying in American public economy. If you apply that logic and the same logic to to the government debt, um, if you go back to say 1982, uh, we had you know about a trillion dollars in debt. You know, not 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 small, but not uh, huge. We had about 600 billion in revenues. That's our tax revenues, a total of kind of everything uh, thrown in. That's Social Security, income tax, everything. Fast forward to the day. It seems really good. Our, 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 I mean, our revenues are, are up a lot, but our debt's up far more. I was asking some finance students earlier, um, or I was telling you, I guess, at first, is that what I'm looking at here is sort of a debt to income ratio. Because what you've seen a lot when people talk about the debt is our debt to GDP. You ever hear that? Debt to GDP? Right? And when we're okay. And you know, because we only have a debt to GDP about 100%, which is about right. Um, but what I think is more important is debt to revenues. Because does GDP really pay your, your, your debt? No, not, not really, right? It's, it's, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the US government, which is their ability to tax, fundamentally. They don't make a lot of money. They're not a business. Um, they, they, they can tax. And so really, um, what you have to pay that debt off with is that $2 trillion. Bucks. So let's do the math here. What's our debt to revenue ratio here? And you know, you can, let's just round that to two and that L16 is fine. Some finance majors here? <laughs> How much? Two to 16, about eight to one, right. Eight to one. And that's not debt to income ratio. You know, when a, when a banker looks at, uh, at, a, at a business, uh, he kind of wants to know how much money its profit, what profits are. Because, you know, revenues in that business have to go and pay a lot of things. You know, uh, wages, uh, cost of goods, that kind of thing. But same thing is true with government. We need to spend that $2.4 trillion on a whole lot of things. We don't really have any profit in that. We don't have any money to really service the debt. Um, so would some bank lend you money if you had a debt to income ratio of 8 to 1? Would they lend most businesses that? 
especially the business of what I just said is I don't even have the money really not only to pay you back, I don't even have the money to pay the interest. I kind of have to borrow money to pay the interest off. Probably not. Probably not. So uh, before I go to the next slide, just real quick, why do you think the government can borrow money? But you can borrow money very easily now, yet that business and individual can't. What, what's the reason the government can do this? Because it can't. They borrow lots of money right now, right? Pretty cheaply. I think what you mean is we can easily print more, right? We can print money. Problem solved, right? Let's we'll talk about that. I'm going to jump back for a second. I sometimes skip this question. Maybe this is what kind of we're, we're thinking about. Um, and I'll get back to that in just a second. In terms of this debt, before I go on to the money side of it, um, what's our credit like? It's something to think about. I don't mean our debt ceiling. Our debt ceiling we can raise any time Congress agrees. But credit limit is where people who lend to our government says this is too much, right? This is too much. We can't do it. Um, we're about 16 trillion right now in debt. Obviously, you know we haven't had that problem. So where do you think our credit limit is? What is our debt ceiling? What's our credit limit? I want some hands. Show of hands here. All right. So everybody who votes for A, raise hands. 15 to 20 trillion. At some point in that range. People are going to say, forget it, I'm not going to lend money. All for B, 20 to 25 trillion. Okay, got a few takers. C, 25 to 30 trillion. Any takers? Okay, we've got a ways to go. How about D, unlimited? Majority of people say that. All right. Let me tell you, if that's true, then I've got the way to get this economy roaring, right? It's called the Weaver Stimulus Plan. Wasp. It's going to get this economy you know, stinging, and we're going to roll for it. And what the Weaver Stimulus Plan is, is I'm going to get rid of all taxes, right? I'm just going to eliminate income tax. I'm going to please Republicans, Democrats. I'm going to get rid of that corporate tax. Oof. I'm going to get rid of Social Security taxes. Oh, they're all gone. We'll just borrow it all, right? It's because if there's no credit limit, we can just borrow everything, right? Why would you need a tax? Right, probably won't work. We probably do have some credit limit, don't we? And that's important. Maybe we'd like to think we don't, but we sort of all know, yeah, probably not. Otherwise, we could do just what I said. Get rid of all those pesky taxes and just borrow it all. I'm going to tell you, in my mind, we actually have already hit the limit. I'd say in 2009, you hit the limit because that's when we really had to start printing money to borrow, I mean, to finance our debt. That's the point at which we no longer had enough people, in a sense, to buy our debt, and the Federal Reserve came in and bought it. This is my feeling. I've talked to people at the Fed who will basically tell you as much. They were scared to death in 2009 that we would have a big problem selling our debt, and that interest rates could soar 5, 6, 7, 8 percent, or we might even have a failed treasury option. Now, you know, we wouldn't be able to sell all of our debt. So I would say at the point that you are printing money to buy your own debt, you sort of throw in the towel and try to help you said, I'm worried that the market won't take it. So I'd say, we really kind of hit our credit limit in 2009. And we're staying there because we're still having a problem. You know, everybody, does everybody know the term QE, quantitative easing? Just another term for printing money. Fed likes to use these terms that nobody understands. What is quantitative easing? It almost sounds like something good, right? It sounds like, um, you know, it sounds like you forgot constipation, you take quantitative easing. Do it. <laughs> so we're now up to basically QE4. Still printing. And in fact, I'll talk about how much we're printing in just a second. Okay. We're going to apply that logic I used on money printing, or I used on the housing we used to recover debt, to talk about how it relates to the dollar bubble pop. When things start to change and become very unsustainable, you, can, you, worry about, you, should have, you can actually print money. Some people say, oh, it's terrible, it's fiat currency, it's all awful. Not really. You can actually print enough money, as long as it basically goes in line with the growth in your GDP, you kind of need to print money. It's part of what allows you to grow. You need to print a little more than you grow, because you need some for blending. You, need, you know, a lot of ways to kind of boost the economy. Well, if you can actually see our, oops, is that right? No? Okay. Well, this is our GDP growth right here. 
And basically, you can see it kind of went up along a reasonable level, and then it flattened out in the 2007 2008 recession. That's our money supply. And you can see it kind of along, went along the same lines as the GDP. And then 2007, it exploded. So what happened was incredibly unprecedented. That's unsustainable. You've got to keep that money supply roughly in line with growth in GDP, or you're going to get inflation. Otherwise, we should just do it before, right? But that's your smoking gun, kind of like the housing. When that housing is taking off, and your income's flat, you know something's going to blow up at some point. Here, GDP is going this way, money supply is going up that way, and you're going to get inflation at some point. In fact, I'll ask you, how much do you think you can increase money supply without getting inflation? Again, I'm going to ask you to erase the answer. All who say 100%. That's that if you raise 100%, you will get inflation. Raise that question differently. You think we increase our money supply 100%, we'll get inflation? Okay? 200%. Everybody said 100%, keep your hands down. Boom. How many people think it's going to be 200 Well, you have to go to 200% to get inflation? All right? Everybody, you know, anybody just raise your hand, keep it down 300%. Okay? Anybody say never? Okay. Just what we kind of say is at some point, you are going to get inflation. And let's keep in mind, how much have we increased our money supply already? 300%. So even according to everybody here, that should create inflation. Because that's where we're at, about 300%. Almost everybody voted for one of those three. So that's something to keep in mind as well. One other issue you have with inflation, and the big difference between where we are today and where we were in 1980, a lot of you worried about the debt in 1981, right? No, it's terrible. We're over 20 bucks, 32, we're over 20 bucks. It's terrible. One of the big differences is the size. Now, we have over 15 trillion, actually now 20, or now 16. What's the big difference? If you have a credit card debt of $100 and interest rates go up, who cares? If you have a credit card debt of $100,000 and interest rates go up, that's a problem, right? And that's essentially what we're in. If interest rates go up much at all on us, the US government, We've got a problem because we are the largest holder of adjustable rates in the world. Remember adjustable rate mortgages? How much they got people in trouble? You know, rates would adjust and boom, you know, their mortgages, I mean, if one, one time they'd be paying at 5%, then they adjusted 10%, and they couldn't pay anymore. Well, that's essentially what the US government's got. We don't have technically adjustable debt, but we have short term debt 30% less than one year, uh, average maturity about 5.1 years. It's pretty short term, it rolls over frequently. So essentially, it's like an adjustable rate debt. Yeah, it will adjust fairly quickly. And if it adjusts, at least right now, at current interest rates, which are pretty low, spend about $400 million, billion, excuse me, $400 billion um, on interest. If it goes up to 10%, which isn't very high. Anybody remember the last time we had 10% interest rate? 10%, yeah, we saw that, you know, 1980s, right? Early 1980s, late 70s. If it goes to that, we're spending more than half of all of our revenues, tax revenues, on interest alone. That's huge. So we're pretty vulnerable you know, to something that has happened pretty recently. So what I'm saying is that inflation is your big problem. Because in one sense, I made the case that the debt isn't a problem because we can print money. And that's exactly what we're doing. 2009, we said that's how we're going to start printing money. Uh, because frankly, you know, if we just need to borrow more money, the Fed will buy the bonds, and we're in great shape. They buy the bonds with printed money, so fine. So unless you have inflation, you don't have any problems. Now, I think we will have problems. But right now, it's kind of like home price in 2004, 2005. Nobody thought we had a problem with home price. Nobody thought we had a bubble in 2004. They go, we never, you know, um, home price bubble? Who cares? My home's up 20%, right? You know, last year, it's doing great. There's no bubble here. It's doing fine. Like right now, we have no inflation. So why are you worried about printing this money? There's no inflation. It's obvious there's no problem, right? It's like housing prices. It's obvious there's no bubble. They keep going up in price. It can't be. Um, we don't think it will ever come. Um, and partly, there's some excuses. And we'll go through the range of excuses, I'll call them, for not having inflation. But one of them is that we have a slow economy, right? You have a slow economy, how can you raise prices? And that makes intuitive sense. You know, if you're, if you're trying to get a job, it's a slow economy. It's not like you can get a big raise, right? And if you are trying to sell products, same thing. And what I always say is, well, if that's true, if it's a slow economy, the 
you know, basically keeps down inflation. The hot economy that gets inflation up. Um, and I got the, it's a little beat up, but anybody see, how many people have seen this? It's a $100 trillion bill. Well, not, not, you know, not a piece of Troy. Come on. I'm the richest guy in the room. A <laughs> hundred trillion. That's Zimbabwe. So um, that would, you know, it's funny actually before you go on. Um, somebody asked me one time if I bought a cup of coffee with a hundred trillion dollars in Zimbabwe, would I get fifty billion dollars to change? <laughs> um, don't know, but they changed by now. But obviously, what this would say if the, um, you know, a hot economy creates inflation, Zimbabwe must have the hottest economy in the world right now. Right? It must be the greatest place to invest. We should all be rushing over there to invest. No, right, not true, no. Hot economies don't mean you've got inflation. Zimbabwe shows that. It's actually one of the worst economies in the world. That's why you have inflation. And in fact, when's the last time we had very high inflation in this country? 1980s, 1970s. Anybody remember? Probably not, but some people will. Um, what unemployment was like back then? Yeah. Over 10%. Terribly slow economy. Horrible economy. They were shutting down all sorts of Rust Belt steel mills. Uh, Milwaukee had unemployment of almost 14 percent. Rockford, Illinois, 25 percent. It's a pretty, pretty tough time to try to raise wages, try to raise prices. Yet they did. Inflation was well over 10 percent, 15 percent, briefly. So how did that happen? Right? How did that happen? If you've got a slow economy, and even in not only Zimbabwe, but U.S., we still have high inflation. That's because inflation has nothing to do with whether your economy is hot or cold. It has everything to do with whether you're printing money. We all know that. Why is Zimbabwe got inflation? They print a lot of money, right? That's what's driving inflation. So you can have very high inflation in a bad economy, and in fact, that's often when you get it. Why? Because that's when governments are most pressed for money. They give low taxes, they maybe have higher demands, they need to print to make up the difference. It actually makes a lot of sense. Because again, if you look at money supply, so it doesn't immediately create inflation. That's true everywhere. There's one country I know that's a little bit different, Argentina. Actually, about as soon as they print money, they get inflation. There's very little lag factor between the two. Uh, in fact, in Argentina, it's so bad, they can get inflation before they print money. Yeah, because people expect it so much. I mean, think about it. It's good business. It's smart. Raise those prices a little bit. If prices are rolling up 30% a year, who's really going to know if you made them go up 33%, right? And that's a huge difference in your profit margin. There's a huge incentive for businesses to actually raise prices pretty fast in the Argentina. So you're probably not going to see sales decline that much, but that extra 3%, instead of going up 30, going up 33, can make a big difference. Um, but again, they're psychologically more attuned to inflation than we are. And psychology is important to inflation. That's one reason you have a lot of back. And that's one reason it's hard to predict exactly when inflation comes in. Oh, we'll try to do a little bit of that. So, Ours bubble sees the one you're in. It's easy to see the housing bubble, the stock bubble earlier, right? They've all popped. And yeah, this guy went through the tulip bubble. Again, sorry about the fonts here, but you can still read it. So I got out of tulips after the market collapsed, but I'm slowly getting back in. It's a good time now, uh, especially pink ones. Basically, what he's saying is, I'm going to mess up a recording too badly. All right. Um, you know, people want to believe that it's really not a bubble. They want to believe that it's coming back. We all know the tulip bubble was a bubble. But at the time, you know, we're going to think maybe it wasn't, maybe we'll get back in. And so it's really hard to see sometimes that the bubble is there. So fundamentally, what I'm saying is the recovery that we've seen so far is driven very, very much by that government kind of borrowing and printing. Um, you know, borrowing about a trillion dollars a year. Um, as I said before, it's way up to 2007. We put this give you a little chart to kind of show you what the difference is. If you actually looked at our total increase in government borrowing, not just the increase, although, you know, it was 107 billion in 2007, over a trillion bucks, um, or a trillion plus in 2011, if you added up all that extra borrowing, and then you added up our GDP growth, this is what it looks like. Total increase in GDP is right there, not much, about one trillion, a little less, and then about three and a half trillion. So we're actually borrowing more money than we're even getting in GDP growth. So if you want more GDP growth, borrow more money. It works. 
you know, you'd say it hasn't worked that well, maybe not, but it does work. And that's what would happen. Take away that borrowing, and you find that GDP growth would be gone. It would be negative. It's that simple. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at the economy, is don't forget that, you know, big elephant in the room. And if somebody says, oh, gee, but you know, the economy's getting better, we're now at 7.5% unemployment, I would say, oh, really? And how much are you still borrowing? Borrow a lot more. Do the Weaver stimulus plan, you know, hopefully. Um, fill all the taxes and just borrow everything instead of a trillion, and you find unemployment go down even further. Almost got the magic solution here. And of course, it's not just borrowing. We're printing that massive, massive amount of money. Um, you know, 85, does everybody know how much we're planning on? We've got to say it right there. People know that the Fed has announced we're going to buy $85 billion of bonds each month with printed money. Anybody kind of familiar with that? So it's, it's called, it's basically an extension of what we call QE3, I call it QE4. Um, that's a lot. And that, remember why is that important, that printing? Because it's what helps make it easier to borrow, right? So if you don't print, it's harder to borrow. Interest rates go up and it won't work. Again, let me put this in a longer term perspective. This is actually the same chart I had before, but extended out even longer. Sorry, 1916, around when the Federal Reserve was created. If you look at money supply growth, we went up to about 800 billion in that long 89 years to 2007. And then look what happened after that. We're exploding even more. This year, as I said, we're printing 85 billion a month, so about a trillion dollars. So to put that in perspective, in this coming year, we're gonna print as much money as we printed 1916-2007. That's a lot. It's about a 90-year period for rest of the one. What we're doing is unprecedented. These are no ordinary times. And that's what's important to keep in mind. Is, is all of this is working together to, what was it? Airbags, right? Those airbags help keep everything pumped up. And that's exactly what it's doing. But it's at a cost here. But I'll say very clearly, if you never get inflation from this, this is not a problem. I don't say if you never get inflation from this money supply increase, we should do more of it today, well, tomorrow, yesterday. Because if it's not going to hurt us, why are we only printing a trillion? We should be printing three trillion. We should be borrowing three trillion, maybe five trillion. If it's never going to cause inflation, that's what we should do today. Don't wait a minute. We've got to know that is true. Exactly. What we don't know is when this is going to be a problem. You know it's not a problem now. There's nothing that benefits from this now. I'll be the first to tell you. If you reduce this money supply growth, if you in any way, you know, reduce the amount of borrowing, it's going to cause immediate problems to your economy. So the good news: massive stimulus will work for a while. It really does. As I said, I mean, it's now over, you know, a record. Um, from a long-term perspective, that's not that great since the Dow was at almost 12,000 in 2000. Um, down to 14,000 you know, 12, 13 years later. Uh, but still, you know, at least it's back to where it was when the bubble burst. Um, you know, we could borrow even more and print more. And I think we should. If it's not going to cause inflation, I would be a huge advocate of borrowing more and printing more. Um, you know, they said, oh, it comes in to get inflation. So there's really no debt ceiling in a sense, or no debt limit. You can really borrow all you want. As long as the Fed buys the bonds with printed money, it will not hurt the capital markets. It'll be fine as long as you don't have inflation. So that's really a key thing to look for, whether you're managing money or whether you're looking at the economy in general. Uh, one other thing the Fed's assuming this, and I'll get into this, is they're assuming that there's no major financial bubbles. I guess we want to sum up the difference between me and the Fed. It's important that we look at this. I'm not saying the Fed's crazy. That's not true at all. What the Fed's assuming is we're just in a down cycle. The, the, the analogy I like to use, the analogy I like to use is the good banker. If you were lending money to a company that was in trouble, and you've lent a lot of money already, but it's kind of going through a bad year, maybe the economy's bad, or maybe agricultural production's down, it's a drought, would you want to just call the loans right then, put them out of business? Probably not. What you want to do is lend them a little money, get them through the tough times, right? That makes sense. You know, otherwise, you know, you try to foreclose on them, and oh my God, you know, I've got to sell this stuff, and I'm not going to get my loans paid back. So off. the smart banker would give them a little money, get them through the tough times, and he's through. However, if that company is fundamentally losing money because the management's bad or it's just not the right business, you know, unfortunately it's a book seller, which will close a lot of those, whatever it is, maybe you don't want to give more money because you're throwing good money after bad. 
And that's what's happening here is we have bubbles. And if we are trying to stimulate the economy, it works if that business is fundamentally working well. But the business isn't. And the stimulation isn't going to get us beyond the down cycle. This is not a down cycle. I say what we're really facing is a slowdown in productivity. And so I'm different with the Fed on two things. One, I think productivity is slowing down. And two, I think we have a bubble economy. And the two are very related. I'll talk more about productivity in just a minute. We'll talk a little bit about the short-term economic outlook. Um, one of the big problems we're facing is everybody else has a much bigger problem than we have. What have you been hearing about Europe lately? Is Europe doing great? How's their economy doing? How many people think that um, France economy was growing in the fourth quarter? <coughs> French economy. Italy, Spain's, all down. Even Germany, I think actually Germany was slightly negative, or close to no growth. Fourth quarter. Japan, also negative growth. England, negative growth. Major industrial drivers of the world are all in recession. And other countries which used to supply China, which is slowed down, and they're still quite positive, which is great in their figures. Um, are slowing down. Australia, Canada, a lot of slowdowns. So you're having a world economy that's slowing down. And that should have a big effect on the stock market. Because, you know, one of these S&P 500 companies, don't they get like 30, 40% of their revenues earnings from overseas? Many of them get even more than half. Anyway, stock market's doing something else because, you know, it's reacting to that printed money. But it should have an effect. But it will have an effect on our economy. That's one reason manufacturing is slowing down. We're not exporting as much. We actually used to have a manufacturing economy that's growing 11% a year. Now manufacturing growth is almost zero. That's the world economy showing up. Um, so as I said, it's not just affecting us. I think the biggest issue we're probably going to find in the world economy is China. Did anybody watch the 60 Minutes show on China on Sunday? Raise some hands. Fantastic little piece. It's only 12 minutes. I'm going to send the link to it to uh, Gene. He'll get it out to you know, everybody here. Um, it's well worth watching. It's a well done uh, piece. 12 minutes. It wasn't anything really that was new to me there, but it was still stunning. China has been doing stimulus that makes us look silly. They control their banks. They're state, you know, state run, not necessarily state owned, but they're state run essentially. And they've been pushing a lot of lending. You're talking about something that really drives your economy. You give money to people to you know, build a project, and it really drives the economy, picks up jobs, everything. Give me an idea how much they've done. They have a mall. Anybody ever been to Mall of America? OK, pretty big mall, right? They have a mall um, in South China. I think it's in Guangdong province or something called the South China Mall that is twice the size of Mall of America. It's driven by the government wanting to, 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 to get jobs, but they don't have the demand for it. They're actually building a recreation of Manhattan down to the you know, center, down to the World Trade Center. They're recreating that. As they showed in the CBS thing, it actually is abandoned now. They stopped all construction. But they are literally trying to recreate Manhattan. A miniature version, but it's still pretty big. That's what's happened in China. They have created this massive amount of empty real estate and other infrastructure in an attempt to keep their economy going, even more than us. So I think if there's any risk out there, China's one risk. And again, it's a big country. They can keep printing money to lend out. But they've got inflation issues. They've got other issues just, you know, what I'm talking about, we could have. Uh, and they've got to worry about a little bit more than we do because, you know, food inflation is a real negative in China. But that's one country that if it goes, I think it will have as big effect as anything overseas on us. When will we hit the wall? Well, it could be a while. Whoops. If I was to put it in numbers, I would say we're not going to have any problem until we get to 5 to 10% inflation. And that's a little bit of a guess. That's why I give you a range. 5% people might even think it's great. You know, oh, we got some inflation. You know, prices of things are going up. That's terrific in many ways. It's not much. But seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there, I think you're going to pop and say, "Ooh, this printing money solution, which Bob is advocating so much, I'm advocating printing three times as so much as you're printing now, and I'm borrowing three times as so much, maybe has a downside. Maybe it does. I'm not really advocating that, obviously. But, um, you know, maybe it has a downside. But until you actually see it, right? It's like the housing bubble. Until you saw those prices drop and drop a lot, nobody said there's a housing bubble. In 2006, prices stopped going up, but people were still dying to buy homes. The lenders made it really easy to do it. Even more liar loans or you know, no down payment loans. And so it, it doesn't really see it. You know, at first, it, you, know, you, don't, you don't see much. But ultimately, you do. And so you actually see that inflation, then things start to change. And that's when I would be most careful. 
Yeah, and now, you know, again, depends on psychology. So that's why I can't say 6%, 7%, I don't know. It's just like, why did the housing bubble, you know, stop going up in 2005, 2006, and then pop in 2007? I don't know. But I can tell you for sure, nobody's going to say you got a bunch of a housing bubble until it starts to go down. Same with the inflation bubble, or money bubble, dollar bubble, bubble. So I think we've got time. Then we have a fairly significant amount of time. Because again, 5 10% of these are a long ways away. <coughs> Years. But we have some problem before then. Real estate markets can go down, and stock markets can go down. You know, there are a lot of things driving this. Stock markets can go up, printed money helps, but ultimately people may look for real economic growth to drive stock markets. Real estate markets, you know, can also go up and down with the stock markets. So there can be problems even before. Um, you know, but right now it's pretty good. I think stocks will probably keep going up. If there's any problem with the stock market, that'll come in with more printing. 85 billion billion isn't the tops. They can print as much as they want. There's no limit other than the amount of bonds out there. There's really no limit what the Fed can print. So if they said that we're gonna go from 85 to 150 billion a month, it doesn't matter. They could easily do it. And that would help your stock market, help your real estate markets. You know, if the stock market ever went down 15%, I think mean, real estate's gonna be in trouble. But you know, market was up 15% last year, it helps real estate a lot. So we'll see, but I would say no major issues there, and probably certainly not this year. And certainly when people react so positively to money printing, I think we're fine. It's only when people react negatively to money printing do I think we have problems with stock markets or real estate markets. The big trap is what we always want. I want my bubble back, my favorite cartoon in the book. Because this really sums it up. It's what people really, really want. And if you think about it, who can blame them? Stocks that go from $4 to $400? Oh my God. Five, six years? Stocks went from $1 to you know, $30. Unbelievable. Homes, you know, you can sit there on January 1st, day after New Year, open up another six pack of beer, rest in your lazy boy recliner, and go, you know what? This is great. By the end of this year, my house will be worth 20% more, and I won't lift a finger to do anything for it. I've got to pay it, I can add on uh, anything, no additions, <coughs> watch an open value. I'll have another six pack in a year. Who wouldn't want that? I love all the money myself, and everybody else does. But the mistake is to think that. You know, all we need to do is focus on giving it back. And that's kind of what we're doing with the money printing and with borrowing, is we're trying to keep that bubble back rather than focusing on productivity, which is where real money and real economic growth comes from. Um, that's a little bit go through that. I don't know how much you want to do aftershock portfolio management. I don't know, Gene, is that something, I don't know, it's maybe more of the finance group, you know, what to invest in, or something like that. Okay. You know. Yeah, if you want to ask kind of questions, I mean, obviously, you know, some of the things you can, you know, invest in, you know, kind of a lot of money managers, but uh, you know, I do think high dividend stocks will probably continue to do well. Uh, I'm more, I'm worried about longer term bonds, not just because the aftershock, but even assuming you have, uh, you know, no aftershock, bonds are now at pretty low levels. So, uh, you know, if they're two percent, they're one and a half percent, one percent, a one or two percent increase is a huge difference. The big difference to us in you know, now in 1980, I mean, 1980 interest rates went up a lot, but they're starting at 6, 8%. They went to 14, you know, it's almost not as big a jump as, you know, when you go from 2 to 4, that's heavily. So I'm a little worried about the long term bonds and keep things shorter. Uh, I do like gold and silver. I think they'll do well. Um, gold finished its, you know, what, 12th year in a row, up last year. Uh, I think it may not, may not do that this year. It's only off a poor start, down about 4%, but it's up 6% last year. I think in general gold will do well, who knows what will happen this year. When people are worried about economies, when people worry about things, and not just in the US, the US could be super happy and not affect gold. Um, you know, other countries buy a lot. You know, countries, you know, Middle East, China, India, they've all got inflation issues, they've all got other issues. I think you know, it'll be generally a pretty good one. Some commodities I think will do well. Um, and uh, you know, you get more aggressive, but Getting aggressive also, especially right now, is probably not a smart move in terms of assuming things are going to short. You know, got a good, good market that is going to last for a while. Um, we'll talk more about that. This is, again, kind of the last chart, really probably the most key from a very broad standpoint. <coughs> but what was happening is we were basically seeing productivity in the 50s, doesn't show up too well, the 1950s, sort of going up at a very reasonable rate, 50s into the 60s, so we see nice. That would have been the trend line had it continued, that dotted line up top. You can see, very different from the red line of where we actually went. And this is the real problem. Productivity was growing a lot in the 1960s. Not that it isn't growing today, it is, but not like this. Some obvious examples. Um, 
let's say 1900, how many people around here, or even in the big city of Denver, do you think had electricity or running water? 1950, almost everybody. 1900, probably nobody. Um, 1900, did we fly? That was in 1903, right? So you couldn't fly in 1900. In 1950, she had 707s. Now we've got 767s. That's great. It's an improvement. It's better. But you can see the amount of change is much less. Just like today, there probably are more people with you know, electricity and water in better shape than in the uh, 1950s, but not like the difference between 1900 and 1950. Uh, electricity, I mean, just economies of scales. Electric utility generating plants, much smaller. They're much bigger today. They're more efficient. And I can go on and on and on. You know, how do we cut wood? How do we mine? Blah, blah, blah. Huge changes between 1900 and 1950s. Not nearly as much since then. So it's not that productivity is increasing, but it's not increasing as fast. And that's where growth comes from. If the productivity is not increasing, we're going to have a flat economy. That's it. We can juice it up, money printing this and that. Those are bubbles. Fundamentally, this is what's really going to drive your economy. And we have to get that going. So long-term solution to all this, increased productivity. Um, and we're going to have to do it differently. Where do most people think of when, they, when we think about productivity? What do they think about? They think about manufacturing, right? They think about assembly line. How do we improve productivity there? But what's our economy today? How many people know what percentage of our economy now is manufacturing? Very low. Good guess. Anybody want to throw out a percentage? Five. Five. Eight. Ten percent. Right. About ten percent. So it's not much. So if we improve productivity and manufacturing, even though that's a good thing to do, it's not going to make much difference. Where is most of our economy right now? I have a clue up there, right? Now I can throw onto that you know, like utilities and finance, finance, real estate, insurance. But if I did all those, I'd have about 60 to 70, about 65 percent of the economy. That's where we have to improve, improve productivity. So it's not as easy in one sense as manufacturing, but we can do it. Uh, there's a great professor uh, of economics called Robert Gordon, called well, named Robert Gordon, at Northwestern University, and he's focused on this part of the got a real slowdown there. He's good to be, you know, warning everybody. What he's not doing is he's saying there, that there's any solution. That's wrong. There's a lot of ways we can improve productivity in all those, and we do very well. I'm a firm believer that our incomes will double, triple, you know, when we get these productivity improvements done. You know, it makes a big difference. I'm not saying they're easy. It's not like watching stock go up from four to 400. Watching your home price go up from you know 20 percent a year by doing nothing, but it works. It's a way we built the U.S. economy where it is today. I always like to use the example of agriculture. I'm not sure I have it there, but uh, you know we used to be a nation in 1800 almost 90 percent farmers. Today, three percent producing far more food than we ever did then for capital. That's real productivity. Food. So that's what it means, and that's why you can sit in a very nice building like this taking education courses and so forth that you certainly could in 1800. All sorts of things. It's that productivity. It may not look like it, it may not feel like it, but that's the reason everything around you see virtually exists today. So with that, um, I think we got a fair amount of time to I want to close about 40, 45 minutes. So we got maybe, well, we got plenty of time for questions. So, um, yeah, we have plenty of time. And yeah, ask anything, you know, for the way off whatever. <laughs> Too late, but yeah, I, you mean on terms of the uh, fonts? Oh. Oh. Okay. So that's a little late. No, but thanks, though. No, I appreciate it. Uh, we just, you know, too close. But, you know, you might argue. Um, um, so, other questions. Other questions? To bring what down? Zero down on the money. To bring the zeros down, meaning instead of having uh deal for oh, thousand, right. have well it, once you have inflation, that's something countries do. Turkey has uh, used to you know, be a billionaire to buy a coke. And about five or six years ago they literally walked off six digits and turned every you know million lira to one. Um, that's what you do once you have inflation. You don't have that. I mean, and I don't think we're going to have hyperinflation. Even a little bit of inflation, if every dollar in your wallet turned to 10, that would be a huge, huge impact on the stock market. So it doesn't take much. 
What do you think it'll take to uh, start reversing the national deficit? Well, um, we already have. I mean, we are down. We're down from 1.3 trillion to probably 900 billion uh, trillion dollars this year. Oh, you know, the better economy helps. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's going to be hard to get it way down. I think we're going to still be adding around a trillion a year. I mean, we're slightly optimistic. We think we're going to go much under this year. Although we'll see these sequester cuts keep going. I think it's tough. And I'll tell you why. You live in Washington, D.C., here in the Virginia area. And do you know how many times I've seen marches downtown in D.C.? Quite a few. Do you know how many times I've seen marches in D.C. where people are all saying, cut my spending, cut my programs? <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to do that from a political standpoint. Politicians don't like to cut spending. Uh, and there's reasons it can go up. We know the aging population will cause you know, spending to go up. Uh, they're just, you know, we have inflation. It really does push things up. So it's hard to uh, control that spending. There's just not, not only politicians, just naturally inclined not to do that. They love spending other people's money. But it is hard. I mean, there's not a lot of voter support for it. A quick way to get cost out of office is to cut a bunch of programs, especially in your local area. But not overall well, national. I mean, we talk about, you know, curbing Social Security, even something simple like raising the retirement age to 67, not going to fly. And, and the problem is, you know, until you see the pain, it's hard to get people to move. But once you see the pain, you're pretty far down the pike. As I said, once you have seven or eight percent inflation, you probably put out five, six, seven trillion dollars of printed money. You cannot pull that back because if you did, you'd immediately crush the economy, and that's the problem. So the problem now is that a lot of people are trying to ignore this problem, thinking maybe we have an unlimited, you know, um, you know, ability to borrow. Uh, thinking that money uh, printing doesn't create inflation, and we ignore it for a while. But you can see, you know, it's hard to cut that spending. It's hard to change. But, you know, it also means it's really tough. You know, it's like a Chinese mirror trap that you don't want. So I think there are ways to do it. I mean, there are absolutely ways to do it. You know, the inflation problem solving is pull the money back out, but interest rates could soar. And, you know, all that. Oh my God, you know, we're pretty addicted to three percent interest rate. You know, imagine what six or ten percent would do. Um, so. It's easy to pull out. It's just there's a, a fair amount of, of pain, economic pain, in doing that. But technically, it's pretty easy. Um, so. You made some excellent predictions mm -hmm. that came true. What are your current predictions in terms of you, you said this, this, no. this, what, 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 what's your time frame that you see? It's it, right. Now, the time frame's tough. I mean, I, as I said, so you're asking the time frame. The predictions here. They came true, um, but it also means there were other predictions that we're going to print or all on, right? That's what came true. Uh, what hasn't come true yet is we've got a problem with it. I mean, right now it's all bad, as we can also say. When does it begin to be a problem? Well, as I said, 5 to 10% inflation will cause you problems. It's not going to be this year, it's not going to be next year. 2015, 2016, yeah, I think that's my most likely time to get 5, you know, 6, 7, 8% inflation. Whether that, I think somewhere there's going to cause a problem, but I don't know for sure. These things are not as exact science. It's like predicting, a lot of people know, what's the internet bubble going to pop? You know, a lot of people know there's a, you know, some sort of bubble there, but whether it's 1999, or 2001, or 2002, who knows? Why March 2000 to this day? I have a hard time finding for me an investment banker that I know, or anybody who can tell you exactly why it popped in March 2000. So timing is tough. And that, that means it's, you know, um, but I can say if you don't get 5% inflation, you're going to have it. Again, unless this stuff causes inflation, you, you really can keep it going. It doesn't mean we can keep our economy roaring. You know, we were studying this plan. We can get our economy roaring. You know, just get rid of all those taxes and print a lot of money. But I don't think we're going to do that. I, you know, I think we're already seeing our, the appetite for printing or for borrowing is down. Printing is up, but there's limits. I, I, I think, you know, they're not going to. If they went to 150 billion, it wouldn't be that long. I might be wrong. But I think there's one that's more than that. What is your thoughts about our dependency on the oil and gas and energy of importing our energy versus domestic? Well, I think we're going to be dependent for a long time, which is different from a lot of people say. Can you repeat that question? Um, the question is what, what about our dependence on foreign oil and gas, or foreign oil, uh, which we're very dependent on right now? Um, I think it would be dependent for a while, if for no other reason, just the numbers aren't good. We produce about 6 million barrels a day, and we consume about 18. 
the big gap for us to be energy independent on oil. So keep in mind, on coal and gas, though, natural gas, we are energy independent, right? And we can even you know, potentially export natural gas. We certainly export coal. So oil, though, is trickier. Some people say, well, oil in you know, production's gone up. We've gone from about 5 million barrels a day to about 6 million barrels a day over the last few years. And if you project that on out for X number of years, you know, we'll be energy independent. Always be wary of projections like that. If anybody who says that what we've got now is going to continue forever, um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, my, my main concern, and you know, without being too technical, is a lot of that oil is from shale oil, as we know. And shale oils are very short lived. And that worries me. I think people are overestimating how much money they're, they're really making or getting from this. Um, in the Bakken shale in North Dakota, which is the biggest producer right now, the wells last about three years. And they produce every about 300 barrels a day, and they die off when they come in. It's not very good. It's not like a sand well. Um, my dad used to be in oil and gas drilling in New Mexico. And there are wells that have last 20, 25 years. Not a high production, but they'll last that long. They'll produce pretty well for 10 years. Shale oil wells are just both. They just blow out and they fall very fast. So I'm just wary about the predictions on this. And I'm wary about just how much. I did grow up in Houston, and I remember 86 and 86, and it didn't happen. Oil people are optimistic. They have to be. If they're not optimistic, they'll be out of business. So you have to be. I think that's great. But I think also be careful about assuming, just because we've gone up a million barrels a day in the last three or four years, that we're going to be able to go on another, you know, what's that going to be, four, eight, 12 million barrels a day um, in the next 10 or 15 years? I think it's a bit of a stretch, but we'll see. Natural gas, I can say for sure, it's underpriced. Uh, I you know we're not going to be, they're already cut the number of refueling like natural gas by almost 50%, just because it's such a low price that we can't make money. And that's another thing. We've got a lot of oil and gas. In fact, does anybody know that the largest reserve of oil in the country in the world, virtually, is in Colorado? Dry oil shale. Not wet oil shale, but dry oil shale. The USGS estimates about a trillion tons in Colorado. We got a lot of oil and gas, and there's a lot of other places like that. But it's the cheap oil and gas, not necessarily. And a lot of the cheaper oil and gas is the drill, which makes sense, right? Um, so, you know, we'll see. Definitely, well, a lot of energy, not an issue. Exactly what price, though, I think that's another issue. I don't think we'll have $3 natural gas forever. It means they've got to go to 5% or something. We'll see how much money they're making. They need to $9 a barrel oil. They're making some. But we also got very low cost of capital. The interest rates are very important to keep making those investments good. So, you know, if interest rates can stay very, very low, I think that'll help the oil shale keep going. But even oil shale, we're not, you know, the rig now is stop increasing. So I think the reaction to the fact it's not that profitable. Maybe rig now will start up again. We'll see. What is your advice to young people today, um, once they graduate from college, to be mm -hmm. productive in the type of economy that we are currently in? I was reading an article in the Denver Post yesterday. They cited uh, an example that for a child born in the year 2013, by uh, 2030, you know, 30 or 31, when that child goes to college, he'd be looking at $175,000 to go to Adams State University in Alamosa, Colorado, $324,000 to go to University of Colorado Boulder, and $650,000 to get an undergrad degree at Stanford, a private school. So when you get young people graduating with sometimes, increasingly so, um, six-figure debt, um, how do they get ahead? What does productivity look like? Um, in their life in terms of everything they come to expect leisure time, and what, what happens here? Well, productivity and education means you can educate people at the same level you can now with absolute people. That's what productivity and education looks like. But, you know, again, there are obviously a lot of issues involved in that. But what I would also say is, again, be aware of a projection of exactly what's happening in the recent past that happened going forward. Tuition's really been going up heavily, mostly in the last 20, you know, 30 years. If you actually look at tuition increase between 1950 and 1970, it wasn't that bad. Um, I mean, I can tell you, this will probably shock you, my tuition undergraduate at the University of Texas was $500 a year, most of which went to my health care and so forth. So I think tuition was actually about 200 bucks. Um, but, you know, it had actually not gone up that much in the 50s or 60s. So that's a new phenomenon, and I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think massive tuition increases are sustainable. So I think that's going to change. Um, that said, they're obviously high. Um, and I would say for people, you know, for the debt, I mean, I don't have a great solution. But what's really going to happen? Obviously, people are going to take out loans and they're going to default on I mean, you know, that's, that's the real truth. 
Uh, does anybody know that we now have more student loan debt outstanding than consumer credit cards? Uh -huh. Consumer loan debt has exploded. Part of what made the bubble, I'm going to be honest, I don't have an academic institution, but the bubble of intuition that was a massive increase as possible, my, my tuition at the University of Texas is now $10,000 a year instead of $500. What made that possible was big increases in stocks and home prices. It made it very easy, much easier for many people to afford it, home equity loans and so forth. Isn't it interesting that student loan debt, I can put another chart up here, started soaring about the time that stock market you know, failed and home prices stopped going up. There is a direct connection between those two. So part of the tuition bubble is very much related to the housing and stock bubble or massive increase over a long period of time. So I don't think it's going to be possible. For a while, we can shove it off on students and, you know, and, and maybe get loans, but eventually I think that's going to be a problem. Um, so there's no easy way to get out of a student loan issue. Um, you know, probably some of the fault. I think that in terms of how to, you know, be productive or how to get a good job, I think a lot of the old schools are saying, hey, you know, try to you know, find a niche, you know, sell hard, um, maybe consider starting your own business. I'm an entrepreneur and I think it's always a great way to go. Um, and, you know, medical fields are good. And you can get into medical fields and get into your business. So if you're in business, uh, I think medical fields will tend to do best. That's not only demographics, but it's sort of a necessity. And uh, even for the government, which funds a lot of our medical care, I think they'll probably fund you know, a lot in the future because there's a lot of votes for it. Um, and so I think it'll still be an important part of our economy. In fact, I think I showed my book, it's probably going to be 20% of our GDP at some point. Um, so I think that's a good area to go in. Um, but the whole debt thing is an interesting thing. I don't think that debt debt is another chart that's unsustainable. And so it's not going to keep going at that rate. And it doesn't matter. that have jumped up because of foreign investment, like Miami, you know, parts of Florida have jumped up because of Brazilian and South American investment. So, you know, you have to be a little careful looking at real estate markets. But clearly, I think they're a reflection of people's confidence in the economy and, you know, and so forth. But I like looking at the stock market. If I really have one way to look at people, you know, how they go look at the economy, it's the stock market. It makes people feel good about spending. It makes people feel good about buying real estate. And then the stock market has become a much more important gauge for all of us. I think we really look at it, even if we don't have stocks, although many of us have stocks, and even though we don't know it because it's in pension plans and so forth. Um, but I would look at that. But real estate clearly is important. Um, and the fact that it's bouncing back, I think, is an indication of some rebound in the economy, but some of the true by investors. Also, if you actually look at real, like, single home sales, they haven't gone up that much. And that's part of that problem our economy is facing is, you know, even though that's bounced up a bit, I mean, we're up from, like, 330,000 homes to 420. It's a nice increase, but it's nothing like one and a half million if you're used to it. And that's one problem we're facing for you know young people I don't have an immediate solution for is manufacturing and construction jobs have gone down. Even if you're not training for those right now, they're going to affect a lot of industries you go in. So construction jobs went way up, then they went down, and now they've kind of been flattening out. Manufacturing jobs went you know way down in the last 10 years, long before the financial crisis. It came back a little bit, not much. So we've got two big holes in our economy, and those support a lot of white-collar jobs as well. And that's probably not going to be an easy, immediate thing to solve. Even the housing bill, as I said, it's, it's, it's just not much compared to the drops. And that's part of, in fact, probably if I really did a close study here, I bet you that's a lot of the long-term unemployment problem right now, is just that, that manufacturing and construction is, is way down. Um, so I know that the uh, government spending sequester just went into effect like this week. So what effect do you think that's going to have on the economy? Not much at first. They're going to be very careful about what, what, you know, what, what effects they really get right away. Um, and then the nature of the government budgeting process. Uh, you know, this is just between now, I mean, this is for the money they're asking for for 2013. They're not going to get some of the money they want. I was talking to somebody at Smithsonian. They said, you know, a lot of the projects we'd like to do this year will be cut by, by sequester. But we have a certain amount of money going, you know, for our current base needs. Um, and even if they do start to take more effect, it's not going to be until more like May, June. Um, so I don't see a lot of effect right now. And again, I'm not sure they're going to do it. I mean, there is every chance in the world that as part of a deal we get a budget, that we're operating without a budget. Um, the government usually does, but we're going to have to get one in the next month or two. 
um, that might you know, precipitate an agreement. Uh, we're going to have to raise our debt ceiling. Uh, I think we've been able to kick that off in August. But, you know, I don't know if there's been any penalty for the fiscal year that ends in September. But, you know, there could be some chances that they'll figure out some way to replenish some of the spending. Um, but, you know, if they all go through, yeah, it's about a half to three quarter percent increase in our GDP. And our GDP that's growing on average over the last six months, about one and a half percent, that's, you know, that's a big cut. Uh, we'll see if they actually do it, but nothing like that. How far do you think that they can keep pushing the debt ceiling up before we are really in trouble? Yeah, yeah, back to that slide. I, I'd say as long as Ben is willing to buy the bonds, why not? You know, there's really no immediate problem. As I said, the problem with the system right now is there's an immediate problem to cutting and not borrowing, whereas there's really nothing that's going to go wrong with borrowing as long as the Federal Reserve is willing to print money to buy those bonds that they're you know, using to borrow. There's really nothing wrong with it um, in, a, in a short term basis. So I don't see you know, people worry about it. Um, that's not a warning, I really don't. Uh, I mean, I think they're not going to want to do what I would say is, you know, kick it up to two or three trillion to get rid of all taxes. But not because we couldn't technically do it, just because they think it would sort of make it real obvious we got a problem. Um, so I think we should keep kicking the debt ceiling up for quite a while. Uh, for a while. I think they will. What is your perspective on the impact of lowering our corporate Yeah, I think cutting corporate tax is a good idea. It is sort of a double taxation. Um, I, I think it makes sense. I think it's, it, it's something that we will do eventually. Um, I don't think there's any chance we're going to do it right now, um, partly because people are worried about the deficit. Uh, and where would you cut spending? There's, you know, and right now, such a big decrease, um, you know, especially with the Democratic administration, the Democratic uh, Senate, you know, you're going to find they're not that interested in it. And again, you know, there is a real life question, all right? It's easy to cut taxes. We've done that before, but we're not cutting spending along with it. And so if you don't do that, you know, um, you know you're creating more of that problem. You know, that said, I'm not, you know, I just, I just don't think politically it's going to go through it. And I think partly because of that, we going to be offset you know, spending cuts. Do you believe if they were able to cut the corporate tax in half that it would bring both jobs Well, I think they're, you know, I think it'd be a help, but, you know, specifically, it's going to bring jobs back to the outsourcing manufacturing, you know, maybe. Um, but a lot of the outsourcing's already taken place. There's still some. I mean, the real thing is going to help manufacturing is get our exports up. Um, and in terms of the other issue, cash, I mean, part of the problem is people, you know, companies aren't spending the cash they got. I mean, we've got huge amounts of cash on the sideline. And companies aren't spending it. In fact, they're spending mostly to buy, I shouldn't say mostly, but a lot of them are spending to buy stock. Um, which is part of what's helping the Senate market. Um, I think corporate income tax is part of a broader sort of, um, you know, change you need to make in your taxation and everything else to improve productivity. Um, but cutting it immediately, I think, yeah, would help, especially if, you know, if you don't, if you don't raise taxes, I mean, if you don't cut spending, uh, again, it's, again, back to you know, boosting the economy to keep your deficit. But um, uh, I think it's a plus, but I think it's, Maybe not as simple as, all right, now we'll, now we'll spend this cash, because they're not spending the cash right now. And that's a problem we've got. Companies simply aren't finding as many good investments as they used to. They really don't. And they've got a lot of cash. Uh, and they can easily borrow. Big companies certainly can. Big companies can easily borrow cash now. Um, right there, we got inflation. Um, 
So I, I use CPI because that's what the market's going to look at. Um, in terms of, of the cost of the government's debt going up, uh, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll go up with interest rates, but that's where you're going to get a disconnect for a while is, you know, the Fed can keep down interest rates by printing money and buying bonds, um, even if inflation goes up. You know, so and, and there's going to be, eventually you can't do that, but for a while you can. But you're going to put a little disconnect for a little while. I mean, we already have it right now. I mean, in the past, you used to have to pay a premium on top of inflation to borrow money. That might make sense because there's a risk. You want at least inflation. No more. Well, inflation is a 2%. You know, it bounces around. But let's say it's a 2. I mean, 10 year bonds are you know, as low as 1.5%. No risk factor at all. Um, you know, mortgages are 3.5%. Inflation is a 2. Okay, 30 a mortgage. There's a real risk in that. So we're already got a disconnect. I think they'll continue for a while, but ultimately that inflation will pick up to a point where it will change. And it could change relatively suddenly because it's a psychological thing. It's very much like, you know, the, the internet stock bubble in March. Why did it change then? Psychology changed. It wasn't just everybody's earnings in the South right then or, or something like that. It was that psychology change. People recognized that there was a problem with internet stocks. And I don't know. Same with, same with you know, also with, you know, bonds. And there's some kind of the books you talk about the next global financial meltdown. Yes. How far do you see? Um, it could be, it could be said, yes. Uh, you've got a world bubble economy that, that you know, in China could be real soon. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, enough that it's, 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 it's uncomfortable to talk about. I mean, you know, what we find. Uh, the stock market can go down a significant amount, real estate can go down. I mean, let's face it, that, I mean, the stock market in 1980 was at 1,000, you know, on the Dow. Real estate was a lot lower. And we were still okay. I mean, we still had a great economy. But we still have a big, huge economy. Asset prices don't necessarily mean, you know, they're not necessarily tied to a great economy. Uh, Japan, you know, we saw their stock bubble decrease 70, 80 percent. Okay? They still had a big economy. It still was the second largest economy in the world for a long time. But asset prices aren't high or not as high as Japan. And the same thing happened in the US. You can have big drops in asset prices, and, you know, I don't think this will be true, but you can still have a relatively, you know, large, active, you know, economy, just like Japan. Real estate also went down about 67% in Japan. And stay down. So you can have big drops in asset prices. That doesn't mean your economy is going to drop 60%. But asset prices can drop a lot. Um, you know, again, in the 1970s or 60s, we were a perfectly okay economy. We had asset prices a lot lower. Follow up question What do you see if retiring baby boomers having to put their money in to be able to maintain themselves until that very far? This is tough. There isn't. That's the problem. There's some stuff. I mean, right now, I mean, they made 50% of the stock market last year. Even if I average with the year before, that's 7%, which is what most people like to see out of it. Um, so short term, you know, that stuff, I think, more fine. I think you know, bonds is the one big flaw in people's retirement plans right now. And that's causing problems for life insurance companies, everybody. I mean, how do you pay 3 4% when you know your bonds are getting too? So bonds are the real Achilles heel uh, for retirement. I'm not, you know, that's not news to anybody. And that's part of the reason they pick lunch in the stock market. They're desperate to make some money. And, was, and that's, you know, part of the idea is move people to risk your assets. But the problem is that there's no fundamental economic justice behind it or you know, justification. Uh, I, you know, it's just like the housing. I mean, you could say, well, put your money in housing, it's going up 10 to 50% a year, and that's better than the bond, but ultimately that may not be a feasible way to make it. So it's tough. I mean, the reality is you're just not going to get those returns anymore uh, easily. I, you know, I can tell you some wild things. I mean, if things really go bad, gold will go way up. But I don't see everybody putting their retirement on gold. Um, so there will be things that go up. But the traditional stuff, stocks and bonds, I don't I mean, you know, it's, you know, especially if you look at it from a, a gain standpoint. I mean, you know, it's not just bonds go up to 4%. But if you already own bonds in your portfolio, and interest rates go up to 4 or 5%, you've lost, you know, 30% of your money. So bonds not only become now no longer a source of income, but no other source of security, you will you know, start losing principal value. Um, again, the benefit of all that is coming down on you know, bond prices. We have the best bond bull market in, we've ever had in our history, and we have low prices, but you're setting yourself up for a problem. And I'm not going to say you're not. You've set yourself up for a big problem by the 2% interest rates. A lot of the factors you talked about relate back to bonus sentiment. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it'll happen relatively suddenly, but it's kind of like, well, like China. I mean, China's been bubbling around for a while. I mean, I've heard all sorts of reports about the issues in China. And also, it didn't make sense to me that China's economy was growing so much when exports were doing it. Well, the rest of the world was doing it, especially with a very recent slowdown. So there were a lot of red flags. Um, but I think when you see things like that in 60 minutes, to me, that says time's you know, getting nearer. I remember when the um, uh, bubble, uh, the internet bubble hit, there was a, uh, there was a cover of Fortune magazine that said, how to make money in the internet. It was, you know, pump up your stock or something, you know, get stock, uh, give it out to friends and family, uh, go public, sell it off quick, and everybody gets rich. Um, you know, except obviously, you know, guys want your stock. And, and when I saw something like that, that was like, I don't know, it was like January of that year, January 2000, you know that something's going up. So when you start to see people worried about inflation, that, oh my God, you know, right now the feeling is that the Fed can print unlimited amount of money, and because it's being held in excess reserves, velocity is low, you have a slow, I mean, I can go all through all these things, we're fine. But if you start to see people talking more about this printing money will cause inflation, that to me is an early sign of the uh, problem. Well, start to see more talk about inflation. And also if you start to see people more talking about fundamental growth problems, like, in fact, we're seeing Robert Gordon get talked about in productivity studies, you know, general reasons. But it takes a while. But those are the kinds of things I look for. People start to see more and more reality. Right now, they're going to focus on a green shoot. You know, hey, Bob, what about manufacturing? What about oil and gas? What about this? Eventually, some of those green shoots will die out, some already have. But we'll have a few new ones. But if you start to see focus on a little more of these more fundamental issues, um, then I think that's when things start to change, especially with inflation. Okay. Exactly. So thank you.